Welcome to Storytime for Grown-Ups from the Ashland branch of Pamunkey Regional Library. My name is Garrett and our story today is Poison from the collection Wild West by Elmer Kelton and published by Thorndike Press. Poison. It was the prairie dog law that brought Dev Leindecker to Old Man Edgewood's long E outfit. You don't find many prairie dogs in Texas anymore, but 40 years ago, the whole studded dog town spread over so much of the state, crippled up so much livestock and ruined so much grass that the legislature passed a law requiring every ranch owner to exterminate prairie dogs on his land. Old man Edgewood never would have hired Leindecker's kind if he hadn't been so tight-fisted about everything but whiskey. He liked to throw a big, long binge every now and again, but otherwise he never squandered a nickel. He was close hurting his money the day he rode into Midland looking for a man to poison his prairie dogs so the county wouldn't do it and assess him a stiff price for it. Leindecker was a big, brawling bear of a man, so tall he had to duck to walk through a saloon door. He had a broad, sun-darkened face with a flat mouth and the coldest wolf eyes a man ever saw. Few ranches would hire him anymore. He'd generally last about a week or two before his mad dog temper would bust loose and he left some cowboy beaten half to death. The sheriff had been eyeing Leindecker pretty close for a day or two when old, man, when old man Edgewood propositioned him, offering him $10 a month less than the going wage. Looking over his shoulder, Leindecker took it. I got a roundup crew going, uh, Edgewood told him. Anytime you're working close to the wagon, just ride over there and eat. Otherwise, you camp and cook your own. Then, hating roundup work like poison, the old man took the TP train for Fort Worth and a wine and wild women spree that was apt to last a month. That's how it was that nobody had the authority to, to fire Leindecker, and there wasn't anybody big enough to run him off. Now, besides his black temper, Leindecker had, a, had another strong characteristic. He was as lazy as a hound dog in the sunshine. The first thing he did after he Mixed up, mixed up a batch of strikenin and grain and loaded it into the ranch's rickety old wood hauling wagon was to hunt the roundup crew and chuck wagon. He didn't name to cook any more than he had to. The wagon cook was the first man to spot him coming. Old Cooney Peel spat disgustedly and wiped the biscuit dough off his gnarled hands onto the flour sack apron tied around his flat middle. The kid horse wrangler missed that. Jinx Cavanaugh's blue eyes lifted an in interest over the rim of his steaming coffee cup. Stranger coming. Cooney's age-paled eyes narrowed. His voice had an edge to it. No stranger to me. Go see about your horses, boy. The horse jingler drained his cup, lingering a little to satisfy a kid's curiosity about the man coming in the wagon. He stooped over an open Dutch oven and picked up a cold biscuit left from breakfast. Cooney hollered at him, and you quit feeding biscuits to that paddle-footed sorrel of yours. He's a bigger pest than a pot-licking hound. Grinning, the gangling button untied his sorrel from a thorny mesquite 50 yards out of camp. He took a bite out of the biscuit and fed the rest of the horse. Swinging into the saddle, he hollered back, Old age is ruining your cooking, Cooney. Them biscuits ain't got any more salt in them than you have. Cooney hurled a chunk of firewood in his direction, missing him on purpose but coming close enough to make the sorrel spook and almost spill the kid. He chuckled as Jinx wildly grabbed leather. Old Cooney had never married and had kids of his own. He often thought that, if he had, he'd have hoped for a boy about like Jinx Cavanaugh. Dev Leindecker halted his gray horse team a respectful distance from the cook's fire and climbed down. Tying the reins to the wheel, he swaggered into camp. Howdy, Cooney. If I'd known it was you a-cooking, I never would have hired. It was meant as a joke, but sounded more like the truth. He extended his big hand. Cooney didn't take it. Instead, he wiped his hands again on the flour-dusty apron. Curtly, he said, there's coffee in the pot. It's two hours till dinner. Resentment flickered in Leindecker's narrow eyes, then went back into hiding. He poured coffee into a battered tin cup and squatted on the run-down heels of his worn-out boots. This kind of hostility wasn't new to him. Seemed like he ran into it almost everywhere he went. 
Old Cooney Peel went on about his business, kneading dough or limping around the chuck box lid to check the dried apricots soaking in water there. Now and then he stopped and leaned against the wagon, favoring his right leg. It was that leg which had taken him out of the saddle and put him behind a chuck box 15 years ago. That leg and an owl-headed bronc. Cooney recognized the wood wagon Leindecker had been driving. You working for this outfit now? Leindecker nodded. Edgewood hired me to poison off his prairie dogs. Told me to eat up the chuck wagon as much as I could. Cooney scowled, like he had swallowed a half-raw mountain oyster. All right, but you better keep that wagon covered up. First time a horse sticks his nose in that poison grain, somebody's going to take an axe handle to you. Before long, a column of gray dust began a slow move across the buffalo grass prairie toward the two wooden windmills where the chuck wagon was camped. The warm west wind brought with it the bawling of cattle. Cooking, Cooney could watch the cowboys working the herd out yonder on a tromped off roundup ground along a barbed wire fence, half hidden by swirling dust. Presently, the main body of the herd was pushed into the big wire pens below the windmills. Three cowboys stayed behind with the cattle that had been cut out of the herd. Boyd Runnels, wagon boss, was with the first men who spurred their horses up to the wagon for Chuck. Tying his horse, he glimpsed Dev Leindecker sprawled in, in the shade. Cooney, he muttered darkly, pointing his whiskered chin toward Leindecker. What's he doing here? Cooney told him. Runnels' jaw clenched. Hank McKee's out yonder with the cut, the boss said worriedly. Apt to be trouble when he rides up here and finds Leindecker. Cooney looked up sharply. What, what's Hank got against him? Well, Leindecker prodded Hank's brother into a fight over at the 7B last year and beat him unconscious. He's a murderous devil when he cuts loose. Hank's brother can't hear thunder now, and the doctor says he never will. It happened about the way the wagon boss figured. Hank McKee saw Leindecker the minute he rode into camp. His lips tightened, but he didn't say a word. He filled a plate and cup, then sat down cross-legged to eat. But he never ate much. He and Leindecker sat there smoldering, their angry eyes stabbing hate at each other, till McKee jumped to his feet and flung his cup full of hot coffee into Dev Leindecker's wolf face. Leindecker burst up at him with a roar. McKee was big, but Leindecker was bigger. His huge fists relentlessly drove the strength from McKee until the cowboy was down in the sand, groggily shaking his bloody head. Leaning down, Leindecker grabbed a handful of McKee's shirt and jerked the cowboy erect. His crunching fist swung. McKee's body jerked and fell limply. Ferocity gripped Leindecker. He fell to his knees on top of the half-conscious cowboy and beat him with his rocky fists. Cooney Peel had seen all he could stand. He grabbed a heavy iron pot hook from the side of his chuck box and limped up beside Leindecker. Stop it, Dev, or I'll brain you! Leindecker ignored him until Cooney swung his arm up the pothook whistling. Grudgingly then, he stood up, his fist still clenched and the wildness still running unchecked through his eyes. His gaze flickered from one man to the other, challenging. McKee started it. You all saw him. Cooney Peel's fists were still tight on the pothook. You better go on out and see about them prairie dogs. The cowboys moved Hank McKee under the shade of the chuck wagon, then melted away toward the hot, dusty branding pens. Cooney and the wagon boss gently washed off dirt and blood with one of Cooney's old flour sack cup towels. The kid wrangler watched, his lips trembling in anger. He better not ever try that on me, Jinx Cavanaugh declared. Testily, Cooney raised his gray head. You got no business here, boy. Get! McKee finally came around. His face was swelling, his lips bruised and cut. He muttered painfully that his whole body was raw and aching. You better ride on up to headquarters and stay till you heal up, Hank, the wagon boss said. You can find plenty to do there. Cooney shot Boyd Runnels a sharp glance. You gonna let Dev Leindecker stay here after this? The boss said angrily. Don't see much I can do about it. It's the old man's orders. It'll happen again, Boyd, Cooney said. Bound to. Runnels helplessly shrugged his shoulders. I know it. And next time, Cooney, you use that pot hook. It didn't take Dev Leindecker long to decide he had done a day's work. By five o'clock he was back. Without looking in the wagon, Cooney would have wagered a right smart that there wasn't much of the poison grain gone. The branding over, the cowboys were pushing the cattle out of the pens and back into the pasture. 
They would loose herd them down there on the fence a while to graze on the mesquite and buffalo grass and give the new branded calves a chance to pair up with their mammies. It always took a while, what with the confusing new smell of dried blood, bone oil, and burned hair and hide. Dusty Jinx Cavanaugh came walking up to the wagon, spurs a jingle on his patched up boots. His hostile eyes met Dev Lindecker's and got a quick, contemptuous response. Then the horse, horse jingler turned to Cooney Peel. Boyd's got him a fat yearling penned yonder for beef, he said. Wants to know if you'll let him borrow your pistol. Cooney grunted. On most outfits, they'd just knock a beef in the head with the backside of an axe and be done with it. But the boys long ago had found out about the old 44 Cooney kept up in the chuck box. It misfired sometimes, but it was still better than an axe if a man's stomach was weak. Cooney reached up and got it handing it to the kid. Tell Boyd the company's going to have to buy me some more shells if it keeps on using my artillery. Forcing irritation in his voice, he pointed his crooked finger toward a loose horse which was nosing around at the edge of the camp, looking for scraps. And chase that sorrel away from here before I swat him in the rump with a shovel. Jenks said, oh no, Cooney, it don't hurt to have a pet. Pet or pest. Ain't a nickel's worth of difference. Keep him out of here. Cooney grinned, though, watching the kid coax the sorrel away. Good button, that, Jinx. He'd be a top hand one of these days. Through the next week or ten days, Dev Lindecker didn't miss many meals at Cooney Peel's chuck wagon. Occasionally he would be gone all day, taking some cold biscuits and meat with him to tide him over till supper time. But before dark, he always found Cooney's camp. He might as well have missed it, no more recognition than he got. The cowboys never talked to him, would hardly even look at him. He stayed off to himself, a brooding resentment hovering over him. He don't act hardly human sometimes, Jinx told the cook one day. I guess poisoning prairie dogs is necessary, and a man has got to eat. But he shouldn't act like he was having so much fun at it. Yesterday I rode up on him after he had put out some bait. He was laying there on the ground, grinning, watching them varmints sample the grain. Didn't even act human, I tell you. So Dev Lindecker stayed around, and day by day the cow camp got to be more and more like a corked jug with a pressure building in it. The plug blew just after Cooney moved camp to Quitman's Mills. The cowboys rode in off drive near noon and caught up fresh horses from Jinx's remuda. Jinx unsaddled his sorrel and roped himself a new mount. The men were half through eating when someone hollered, Jinx, get your horse away from that grain wagon! but it was already too late. The camp pet had shoved its nose under the loose tarp that covered Lindecker's wagon. By the time Jinx could run to him, tripping over his spurs, the sorrel was on its side, thrashing its legs in agony. Help me, somebody, the kid was bawling. Somebody come help me. But there wasn't much anybody could do except stand there, tight-throated, and watch Jinx cry like a lost kid over the sorrel pony. Old Cooney melted some lard in a pan. Think that'll help? Boyd asked. Cooney shook his head. Well, we can't have the kid thinking we never even tried. Runnels held the pony's head up while Cooney forced the jaws open and poured lard down the animal's throat. If it helped any, it didn't show. In a little while, the sorrel's thrashing was over. One by one, the cowboys straggled off toward the branding pens, their heads down, and their boots dragging. Pretty soon, the only ones left were the kid, old Cooney Peel, and Dev Lindecker. Through it all, Lindecker had never moved. He hunkered just beyond the cook fire near the woodpile. He had hunched his huge shoulders and drawn up within himself, putting a hard shell against the contempt of the cowboys. Now the kid's brimming eyes lifted from the dead pony and fastened upon Dev Lindecker. Jinx Cavanaugh pushed himself to his feet. His kid's shoulders squared and his fists clenched hard as live oak knots. You killed him, Lindecker! He exploded in a shrill voice not his own. Lindecker arose and waited, his hands flexing. Choking, the kid broke into a run and sailed into him with fists flailing. It was like trying to drive a spike with his bare hands. Lindecker's left hand grabbed the kid and shoved him off to arm's length. The ox-strong right arm slashed across. Jinx staggered back, his hands defensively lifted over his eyes. A hard grin broke across Lindecker's dark face, 
tugging upward at the sweat-streaked beard. The big man closed in, smashing Jinx first with one fist, then the other. The wrangler sagged, his battered face smeared and ugly red. Strong hands tugged desperately at Leindecker, hands gnarled and old, the veins standing blue. Stop it, Dev! Cooney Peel was shouting. Damn you, leave the kid alone! Leindecker turned half around to shove the old man away. Cooney's horny fist smashed his nose and came away bloody, breasting from the big man a quick squall of pain. With a roar, Leindecker whirled from the kid and grabbed at the old cook. Cooney managed to duck away and step back. Then, the tricky right leg betrayed him, and he faltered. Leindecker hurled Cooney backward into the woodpile, pinning the old man down to helplessness. His thin, hard lips curved in a crazy grin. There was no mercy in the wild gleam of his gray eyes. He was a slashing, killing wolf. A shrill voice made Leindecker spin. Blood spattered. Jinx Cavanaugh poised there. A heavy single tree from the wagon arced over his shoulder. A ball of fear tore from Leindecker's thick, whiskery throat as he vainly tried to jump, to jump away. The single tree snapped his head back, and Leindecker dropped. Gently, the hard-breathing kid helped Cooney to his feet. He hurt you, Cooney? A dull ache throbbed all through Cooney's sparse frame, but he knew it would be nothing serious. I'll make out. Jinx still held the single tree. Worriedly, he looked down at the slack body of Dev Leindecker. Reckon I killed him? An ugly line of red oozed from a long slash across Leindecker's head, but the poisoner's back showed the steady rise and fall of his breathing. You weren't that lucky, son. Now you'll never be able to turn your back on him. Maybe you'd better clear out for a while. Jinx shook his head. Nothing gonna scare me out. After washing, Jinx walked toward the branding pens to make a hand. Alone with Leindecker, Cooney went on with cleaning up the noonday mess. But, glancing often at Leindecker's sprawled form, he made sure his old hands were never far from his heavy pot hook. How long Leindecker had lain there before he regained consciousness, watching him with crazy, hate-filled eyes, Cooney would never know. But when the cook took off, took hold of his wreck pan and carried it off a ways to dump the soapy water out of it, Leindecker got to his feet and made for the chuck box. Caught off guard, Cooney ran toward him. But he was too late. Leindecker had the 44. And when Cooney tried to wrestle it from him, the big man swung it up, then down again. He caught Cooney behind the ear and sent him rolling in the warm sand. Wildly, Leindecker pointed the six-shooter at Cooney, and twice he squeezed the trigger. Both times, it misfired. Then Leindecker turned and weaved heavily out toward the branding pens. Painfully, Cooney pushed himself to his feet and tried to follow him. The dust that, bit, that billowed up in the stifling hot pens was thick enough to cut with a knife. Two ropers on horseback were healing calves and dragging them up toward the branding fire for the flanking crews to grab and hold down. Working hard to make up for lost time, the cowboys never saw a line decker until he was in the pen with them. Over the loud, steady din of bawling cows and calves, someone shouted, He's got a gun! Young Jinx Cavanaugh, bruised and one eye swollen shut, was kneeling atop the neck of a struggling calf, gripping one foreleg with his left hand and pushing the calf's head down against the ground with his right. At the sharp voice, he looked back. Leindecker towered behind him, the gun in his hand in a savage fu fury, blazing in his dirty, black-bearded face. His dry lips pulled away from his teeth. He squeezed the trigger. Jinx slumped forward. The calf broke loose and jumped to its feet, kicking the cowboy who had held its hind legs. Jinx lay limp, his fingers digging into the soft dirt of the corral. Half a dozen cowboys surged toward the big man, but he swung the gun at them. They stopped. Cooney Peel limped into, into the corral. A cry tore from him at the sight of the body lying still in the dust. Leindecker was watching Cooney. This last violent action had flushed the unreasoning anger from Dev Leindecker's narrow eyes. In its place was a cold determination. You, he said sharply to Boyd Runnels, gather up them horses and bring them here. I ain't leaving them so you can hurry no sheriff onto my trail. Shag it, I tell you. He whirled on Cooney Peel. I'll need some grub. You, Cooney, go to the wagon. Gather up the cold biscuits, meat, 
Anything else you can shove into a sack. Cooney hesitated, his stricken eyes still on the boy. Get, damn you! Linebacker bawled. Before I fire this thing, again. Cooney lifted his pale eyes to the linebackers. They were two glittering chips of ice. I'll get you what you need. Boyd Runnels brought Linebecker the horses the healers had been using in, in the branding pen. Hastily, Linebecker chose one of them to ride. He led the others out the gate. Then, shouting at the, at the top of his voice, he plunged toward the saddled horses tied alongside the fence, breaking them loose. He shoved them in front of him, leaving the cowboys afoot. Linebecker reined in beside the chuck wagon. How about that grub, Cooney? Cooney Peel handed him a flour sack, bulging at the bottom. Don't let them forget I've got the gun, Linebecker warned. I'll kill any man who comes after me. Tying the flour sack behind his high uh, candle, Linebecker kicked the horse with his bare boot heels and loped out of camp, driving the saddled horses and, and Cooney's mule team before him. The sheriff and his deputy changed to fresh mounts close to the wagon, then stepped up for a quick bite to eat. Silent, brittle as an old mesquite limb, Cooney showed them Linedecker's tracks. Headed for the New Mexico line, you can bet your boots, the sheriff commented darkly, biting a big chunk out of a piece of fried steak. We'll sure have to ride fast if, if we're going to catch him. Slowly, Cooney shook his head, his pale eyes burning with a cold fire. Take your time, sheriff. He won't make it to New Mexico. The lawman's eyebrows lifted. What's that? He won't get far. Wherever he stops to eat, that's where you'll find him. The sheriff's gaze touched the uh, striking uh, wagon. His jaw dropped in horror as he read the meaning in Cooney's grim old face. My God, the lawman breathed. His tin plate and the food in it fell to the ground as he swung quickly into the saddle and spurred out onto Linebecker's trail, the, the deputy trying vainly to catch up with him. They found Linebecker's body the next morning at a windmill where he had stopped to water his horse and eat a little of the food out of, out of Cooney's sack. Accidental death, the justice of the peace called it. Obviously, Linebecker had drunk some poisoned water somewhere along the way. The roundup was over by the time the doctor let Jinx Cavanaugh go back to the ranch. Cooney's wrinkled old face lighted up like a camp lantern at the sight of that familiar gangling figure. Jinx was pale and thin, but his wide kid grin made up for it as he came swinging up the hard beaten path to the cook shack. You lazed around town long enough, Cooney spoke, hardly above a whisper. I begun to think you wasn't coming back at all. That was all he said, and it was all that was needed. For the stout grip of his rough hand, said the rest. Cooney led the boy out and down to a corral next to the red frame barn, where a little sorrel bronc watched with alert ears poked forward. Board Runnels picked him up down south. Thought you'd like to break him this winter, if you're able. The kid was laughing and talking and crying, all at the same time. Finally, he managed, Cooney, if you reckon that I went back to the cook shack, Cooney smiled, his hand tight on the boy's shoulder. Sure, son. I saved them from the breakfast. Special. You'll find them in the warming oven. Thank you for joining us today for Storytime for Grownups. We hope you have enjoyed the story. Uh, look for us again next month when we will read a new story, something entirely different. Do you have a special story you would like us to read? Please let us know at, at the Ashland Branch Library. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.